right, here we go. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 1. Have you noticed that in the book of Deuteronomy, it's kind of interesting, sometimes the first couple of verses are a little bit different than the rest of the stuff in the chapter, and sometimes the last couple of verses are a little bit different. It's, it's kind of interesting, so always remember those chapter divisions are not part of the inspiration of these books. Those were added later. I'm grateful for them because they give everything an address so we can find it easily. Um, but uh, So that's kind of the way tonight is. Chapter 18, verse 1, the priests, the Levites, and all the tribe of Levi shall have no part nor inheritance with Israel. They shall eat the offerings of the Lord made by fire and his inheritance. Therefore shall they have no inheritance among their brethren. The Lord is their inheritance, as he, is, as he has said unto them. And so we've talked about this previously. We've studied this in Leviticus, and we've mentioned this earlier in the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, but the point is, is that the Levites, they're going to get some particular cities, the cities of refuge, and they're going to get the surrounding areas around those cities um, for, for them to have houses and for their families to live in. Uh, but they're not going to get these big chunks of land like the rest of the Israelites do. And it's, it's pointed out there that the Lord is their inheritance. Okay, And so <clears throat> he goes on and he says, oh, and he, he mentions they're going to eat the sacrifices that are brought to the Lord. And so, so when you brought your sacrifices to the Lord, part of that's going to get burned up, but it's also going to go to feed the, the Levites the, and their, the priests and their families. Verse 3, and this shall be the priest's due from the people, from them that offer a sacrifice, whether it be an ox or a sheep, and they shall give unto the priest the shoulder and the two cheeks and the maw. Isn't that awesome? That's what the Levite got. They got the shoulder, which is, you know, if you're going to if you're going to go and order a steak, what is the one and only steak that you can that you would order that comes from the shoulder of a beef animal, and you can't even get one here. It's called a flat iron, and you have to go to the Midwest, or maybe some really specialty restaurant would actually have a flat iron steak. The shoulder is typically smaller muscles, typically tougher. Uh, this is called the chuck, this portion of a beef, and on a lamb, when you have a leg of lamb, it's not the shoulder, it's, it's the hind leg of the lamb, and so, so this is the part they get. The cheeks, <laughs> the, the two cheeks, so, so they get the head meat. So the priests and the Levites, they made tamales, right? That's what you use head meat for, cheek meat. However, if you properly cook this, most people just chunk it. Don't deal with it, give it away, throw it away, whatever. But if you properly cook it, this is really, really, really flavorful pieces of meat right here, but... You've got to braise it. All of this, this is all braising stuff. And so one of the things that they would do is they would boil this meat. And it's one of the things that the, uh, uh, the sons of Levi did not like. They did not like sodden meat. They didn't want boiled or braised meat. They didn't want the roasts that they had been given. The tongue, that would be part of the cheek meat. So, you know, how many of you have eaten tongue? My family, raise your hand. Actually, it's really good if it's prepared properly. My family, huh? <laughs> Lingua, it's good. And the maw, what's the maw? Yeah, that's the, that's the rumen, that's, that's the tripe. And so these are the portions that the priest got. Now you can use that tripe, I mean, it's very nutritious and if properly prepared, people eat it all over the world, both sheep and, and beef and always have. But that's the portion that the priest got uh, from that. So they also got the first fruit also of the corn, the wine, the oil, and the first of the fleece of the sheep shalt thou give them. And so, so these are the things that are brought in. The Levites get these for their families. This is their food. And if you know how to properly prepare shoulder, it's excellent. Uh, if you know how to properly prepare cheek meat, it's excellent. If you know how to properly prepare tongue, it's excellent. And I actually have had some good tripas, uh, but I was in college, and I just haven't had the opportunity to have good tripe since then. I've also had some bad tripe in Africa, and it was really bad. But anyway, that, that's a story for another day. So, 
He says there, uh, this, is, this is what the, the first fruits of all these things are going to be brought in to the Levites. This is their portion. For the Lord thy God hath chosen him out of all thy tribes to stand a minister in the name of the Lord, him and his sons forever. And so, so this is the system that God designed. He, he traded the firstborn son of all these families for the tribe of the Levites. And in turn, the people were to bring their their offerings and their tithes into the storehouse, and those portions were the portions that went to the Levites, okay? Now he says in verse 6, And if a Levite come from any of thy gates out of all Israel, where he sojourned, and come with all the desire of his mind unto the place which the Lord shall choose, then he shall minister in the name of the Lord his God, as all his brethren the Levites do, which stand there before the Lord. So let's say you've got a, a guy and he's... Uh, He's, he's been living in one of these cities or maybe even outside of Israel for whatever reason. And, and by the way, that's going to happen. And I'll show you one of those guys here in a minute. But, uh, and, and then he, he makes his journey and he comes to Jerusalem or to Shiloh, Gilgal, wherever the tabernacle happens to be. And he's, he's going to serve. When he shows up and he's a Levite, he gets to serve just like everybody else. Not only that. They shall have like portions to eat beside that which cometh of the sale of his patrimony. A patrimony is an inheritance. Well, wait a minute, preacher. I thought you just said they didn't get an inheritance. Well, they didn't from God. They didn't get an inheritance from the, uh, of the tribes of Israel. However, over generations, some of these people saved up money. And once they got scattered to the different places in the diaspora, they bought land, some places and sometimes in Babylon or, or other places that they went. So turn with me real quick. I believe it is Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 4. And uh, verse 34. It says there, Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them, brought the prices of the things that were sold, and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, so this is, this is Barnabas, the guy who's going to go with Paul on his first missionary journey, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, Brought the money, laid it at the, at the apostles' feet. So, according to Deuteronomy, Barnabas could come. He could have land in Cyprus that he had bought or his family had bought as a result of the diaspora or New Jersey or wherever, you know, wherever his family had gone. But for him, it was Cyprus. He sold the land in Cyprus, took the money, brought it, gave it to the apostles, and he could still serve as a Levite at the temple, according to God's word. Now, he probably couldn't do that in those days because the Herodians had control of all of that, but if they were following the word of God. And when he did, what they, they wouldn't be able to say, hey, this isn't fair. He's a rich guy. He shouldn't get part of it. We, he should have to distribute amongst all the Levites. Boy, does this sound familiar in the world that you're living in right now? This isn't fair. He's got money. He's got land. He's got privilege. That's not fair. Uh, God says, hey, that, his patrimony, that's his business. He still gets an equal share with the rest of the Levites when he comes back to Jerusalem to serve with the rest of the Levites. And so, so God lays it all out, and he takes care of these things. Isn't it interesting how God, this is once again, we pointed this out last time, but God can see his foreknowledge, his omniscience, his omnipresence, he knows what things are going to be like in the future. He knows these Levites are not always going to live within the bounds of Israel. And yet the Levitical priesthood, the Levites and priesthood are still going to be ministering in Israel. And as these Levites get scattered in different places, some of them are going to decide they want to come back and they want to serve, which is part of their family heritage. And so God lays this out during the time of Moses. And so if you're lost and you read this, you say there's no way that God that Moses wrote this. This was written later. But if you're saved and you read this, you go, wow, isn't God amazing? He, he made provision for everything, even stuff that wasn't going to happen for generations into the future. So uh, verse 9. Okay, we're changing gears now. Verse 9, we're going to change gears. Now, we've talked about the idolatrous worship that takes place 
in the Canaanite tribes in the country surrounding Israel and how they've been warned and told and instructed over and over and over again. Don't learn about them. Don't study them. Don't, be, don't do these things. Well, he says there, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. So, so don't learn their ways. Don't learn their, their religious practices, their special uh, traditions. Don't learn it. Verse 10. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. Isn't that terrible? I mean, it's just terrible. What kind of a group of people would sacrifice their own children to a heathen god or goddess? What kind of perverse, disgusting, abominable, yuck, nasty, perverted, warped, twisted, mentally insane people would murder their own children? It's a question. It's a question for this election. It's a question that you're going to have to answer, that everybody's going to have to answer. They were doing it thousands of years ago. Now, they waited till they were born, and then they burned them up in the fire. These folks today, they just hide it away. But the same thing is taking place right now today, and it's disgusting and hurtful. It hurts. It hurts to think about it. It hurts to have to talk about it. But he says it's an abomination. Don't learn these things. Do not do it. Not only that, he says, there shall not be found among you anyone that useth divination or an observer of times or an enchanter or a witch or a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits or a wizard or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Thou shall be perfect with the Lord thy God. For these nations which thou shalt possess, hearken unto observers of times and unto diviners. But as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee to, to do. So here's this long list, and I did not plan this, although Halloween is coming up, and this is a, a real fitting time to discuss it. I, I'm just working my way through Deuteronomy. But isn't it interesting? Now here's, here's what all of these things are. The way that each one of these particular things is, is uh, interpreted Sometimes you could swap out these names. So, uh, for instance, you might use the word charmer in the place of wizard, or you might use wizard in the place of witch. And witch doesn't necessarily connotate a female. Uh, it also would incorporate the sorcerer term that would be used for a male, and neither one of those is either specific male or female. But basically, here's kind of what those things mean. Divination is an oracle. It is somebody who's going to use some kind of means to try and tell the future, okay? And these means are as varied as the people and places that you come from. Uh, the old uh, uh, people where I came from in the European Isles, they would butcher a sheep, they would take the liver and the kidneys, they would cut into the liver and the kidneys and look at them and observe them and use that to try to, to tell whether an army was going to have uh, success in battle. Uh, pregnant ladies, you take and hang a wedding ring on a on a string and put it over their belly, and if it turns one way, it's a boy, and if it turns the other way, it's a girl. Uh, people go around with a crooked stick trying to find oil, water, gas, all kinds of different things. Uh, divination, the, the oracle at Delphi used divination, and they, they had a, a, a thing that was suspended. This is not far from Corinth, and they would take these young girls and they would set them over this fissure. It was a, a geothermal fissure in the earth and kind of a cave structure. And they would set her over that. She would breathe this toxic gas. And when she did, well, her eyes would roll back and she'd start uttering gibberish, which only the priests at Delphi could interpret. So you had a question. You went to the priest. The priest listened to the gibberish that the poor little girl that was being poisoned spit out in her you know, altered state of consciousness. And then he told you whether you were going to have victory or you're going to get wealthy or whether you should marry this person or whatever. Uh, an observer of times is basically somebody who believes particular days to be lucky and other days to be unlucky. So, um, you know, it, will, it, would, it would blow your mind to know the number of Dow Jones and Wall Street companies that hired an astrologer to build their chart on the day that, that to determine what day they should start a particular business and what day they should go public with their stocks. It, it'll blow your mind to know how many companies have done that sort of thing. But that's what an observer of times is. Uh, by the way, real quick, turn to Galatians chapter 4, 
and verse 10. <clears throat> One of the things uh, that Paul charges the Galatian Christians with is being observers of times. He says there in Galatians 4.10, Ye observe days and months and times and years. I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. They were, they were still doing these, these practices even after they had become Christians. And Paul, he didn't like that. An enchanter. Uh, this is somebody, uh, it's an onomatopoeia kind of a word in the Hebrew. And it means to hiss or whisper. It's somebody who, who comes up with magic spells. Uh, a witch or a sorcerer, someone who practices magic. And basically, the, 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 the basic uh, understanding of a witch is someone who is in covenant with the devil. Okay? And uh, so, we, of course, we read about the witch at Endor during the time of Saul and uh, her supposed ability to practice necromancy, which is the last one on the list, which is somebody who can communicate with the dead, call up the dead. Uh, there is a, uh, a charmer. Uh, the charmer, uh, well, that would include the snake charmer or the crocodile dundee cattle charmer. Or the, you know, there's all kinds of these different things. And, and here's the thing. Anywhere that you have shamanism, okay, that would include Native Americans, that would include Africans, that would include uh, indigenous peoples, the Inuit peoples up north, the, the deep, dark jungles down in South America, uh, the, the Mongolian tribes in the far, far, far east, the people of India, it doesn't matter where you go. When you have shamanism, you have all of these things. Medicine men, witches, kunanderas, all of that kind of stuff. Down in the islands, you've got Santeria, and you've got um, voodoo, and uh, all of these things all tie together. Um, uh, what else we got? Uh, consulter with familiar spirits. Uh, this is someone who is able to communicate with the devil, basically. Um, and, and by the way, they, they don't think they're communicating with a demon, they think they're communicating with the spirit of somebody who has, has already died and has come back and gives them special knowledge. Um, General Patton believed himself to be the reincarnation of multiple famous warriors throughout time, and he believed that he could communicate with them. Uh, lots and lots of our political leaders have supposedly communicated with the dead, you know, it was a big deal when Hillary Clinton was uh, that she had communicated with Eleanor Roosevelt or with Eleanor Roosevelt's spirit, you know, getting some great information. Why is it, by the way, that dead people all of a sudden have good information? That, you know, some of these people were not real smart while they were alive. Why would they? But anyway, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting study. We're not going to do it tonight. But when Saul goes to the witch, the reason he goes to the witch is because God has stopped talking to him. And Samuel told him, God's done with you. Rip the kingdom out of your hand. He's done. Um, but since he can't hear from God, that's why he goes to the witch. And when he goes to the witch, he's already outlawed all the witches in the land. So it's against the law for her to practice her craft. But Saul disguises himself. He goes in and she is scared to death when Samuel shows up, which tells me that that's not what she's used to seeing. She's used to seeing something or someone else. She's used to receiving her information some other way. Here's the other thing. I would like to think that all of these are simply parlor tricks. Uh, by the way, uh, when one of these is where we get the modern day ventriloquists actually came from the idea that someone would get information through a spirit that would speak through them. That's where the idea for ventriloquism came from. Now it's a parlor trick. Maybe. Uh, Harry Houdini went to his grave claiming that he had occult power uh, throughout his whole career. So who knows? But I would love to say these are all just parlor tricks. These are things to trick people. But I got to remind you of Janice and Jambres. They actually had satanic power to mimic some of the things that Moses, was able, Moses and Aaron were able to do up to a point. And when they reached that point, they said, we can't do this. This is the finger of God. They recognized the limitation of what they were able to do. Uh, God actually allowed Samuel to come back and communicate with Saul in that instance. And it scared that lady to death. She was not used to having dead people come talk to her. She was used to having something else happen for that information. Um, Acts chapter uh, 16, we meet 
a, uh, a girl there, Acts 16 and verse 16. <clears throat> so it says, it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. Okay, so this girl is possessed with a demon who gives her the ability to be a soothsayer. A soothsayer is an oracle, somebody who's able to give clairvoyant information, occult information. She can tell the future. She can, you know, now, now you say, wait a minute, how can the demon know the future? Well, they can't. But since they're connected worldwide, they could give a whole lot of information and they could do really spooky stuff like tell you things about yourself that no one would know because they've got a surveillance system all over the earth. Uh, they could go back and do some, some research on you pretty easily. Uh, there, there's a lot of ways that, that a demon could give someone information. And this girl made her masters a lot of money. It says the same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. She knew exactly who they were, just like all the demons, by the way. They knew, they knew exactly who Jesus was. They knew exactly who his servants were. And so, so of course, she knows that. So she's soothsaying. She's telling them. These, this is who they are. And this did she many days. And this is, by the way, let me, let me just say this when it comes to casting out demons. I do believe that Christians have been given the ability to do that on occasion when the need arises. However, why, if Paul could cast out demons, did he not do it immediately the very first time he encountered that girl and saw what she was? It says she followed him around and did this many days. You know, I think we've got some demon caster outers today who are a whole lot more zealous about that kind of stuff than Paul or the apostles ever were. He, he basically ignores the girl or tries to, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And when her masters saw the hope of their gains were gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them in the marketplace unto the ruler. So, so it causes a big stir as a result of them casting out this demon. So, so here's, here's the whole point. All of these things are practices and people that claim to communicate with the unseen world. They claim to have power to be able to gain information and to uh, uh, communicate with the spirit realm. Every one of them. And here's what God says to his people about these practices. I want you to completely avoid all of these things. I want you to stay away from them. I don't want you to learn about them. When it comes to information about the unseen realm, I want you to listen to my prophet. And that's where we're going next, to the prophet. Before we do, real quick, 1 Chronicles 10, 13. I want to show you a couple things right quick. 1 Chronicles chapter 10 and verse 13 All right, 1 Chronicles 10, 13, it says, So Saul died for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not. Okay, so that was in the instance where he was told to absolutely devastate the Amalekites, to kill them all, and kill all the livestock and everything. And so Samuel shows up, and he said, I did what the Lord told me to do. And he said, Then what meaneth this lowing of kind and bleeding of sheep that I hear? And he had actually saved the best and the biggest of the livestock alive, and he hadn't killed the king, old Agag. And Samuel had to kill the king, and Saul had been disobedient, and he told him at that moment, because you have disobeyed the Lord, God's going to remove the kingdom from you. So he died because of that, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it, and inquired not of the Lord, therefore he slew him, and turned the kingdom unto David, the son of Jesse." Turn real quick back to 2 Kings chapter 21. <clears throat> after, after Hezekiah comes his son Manasseh, and it says Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Hephzibah. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord after the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. 
For he built up again the high places which Hezekiah his father had destroyed, and he reared up altars for Baal and made a grove, as, he, as did Ahab king of Israel. And he worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. And he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord said in Jerusalem will I put my name. And he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he made his son pass through the fire and observed times and used enchantments and dealt with familiar spirits and wizards. He wrought such wickedness in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. So here's two examples of two kings of Saul, the, the entire kingdom, Manasseh, Judah, after the division of the kingdoms. And both of these men were considered evil. Saul lost his life because they consorted with witches and did these kinds of things. So, you know, he, he tells us, he says, thou should be perfect, verse 13, before the Lord thy God. He says in verse 12, he says, these things are abomination. Because of these abominations, the Lord drives these people out from before you. I don't want you to learn about these things. I don't want you to glorify these things. I don't want you to pursue these things. I don't want you to, to, I, I don't want you to mimic these things, copy these things. I want you to stay away from these things. So, as for me and my house, we avoid Halloween because Halloween glorifies these things. And that's it. I don't care whether you do it or not. It doesn't make me any difference. That's up to you. But that's why the Chessers don't mess with it. Because it, it certainly, I mean, I'm jogging down my street the other day. Doo, doo, doo. I kind of trot. Not, not really a jog. I don't know what you can call it a jog. It's kind of a limp, sideways, kind of a trot thing. Anyway, and it's a near-death experience for me every time. And I'm just, you know, I'm just, <laughs> and tunnel vision sets in. <clears throat> but I did notice that over there in my part of the world, some of the horrendous stuff that people put in their yards, it's just nasty old stuff. You know, ugly, nasty looking things, you know? And, and uh, anyway, so I'm not going to belabor the point. That's us. As for me and my house, we're not going to mess with it. Verse 15. Now, all of these things, keep this in mind, because the reason that these two things are in the same chapter together is because God says, when you need information, that's what Saul needed. He needed information. He needed to know what to do next. He needed to know what was going to happen. He needed to know, should he go to war against this enemy? When you need information, where do you go? Do you go to a kunandera? Do you go to a witch, to an enchanter? Do you use divination? Do, do, you, go, do you go to the soothsayer? Do you go down to, you know, uh, <clears throat> Ringo the Magnificent down at Coney Island? Or, you know, I mean, do you, do you go to see these people? Do you see the, look into the crystal ball, let their eyes roll back in tongues, automatic writing? Because people all over the world do just that, okay? Well, what do the people of God do? Well, he says in verse 15, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet. Notice, please, in the King James Version anyway, prophet is capitalized. The reason that's capitalized is because the translators are giving you a clue that he's talking about Jesus here, okay? He says, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee of thy brethren like unto me, Unto him you shall hearken. That means listen. I want you to listen to my prophet. When God reveals a secret thing to his people, he does it through his prophets. He doesn't do it through occult practices. Okay? So he says in verse 16, According to all that thou did, desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more that I die not. And the Lord said unto me, they have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet. Okay, so, so remember Sinai. Remember when God thundered in his voice and it scared them to death. And the mountain shook and it caught on fire and thunder and lightning. And they said, oh, don't do that again. You go talk to God. Come back and tell us what he says. We'll do it. Okay, it terrified them, scared them to death. And so God said, all right. I'll use a prophet. And that's what he did. He sent prophet after prophet after prophet from Moses all the way down. Even before that, he's doing that. But, but he's, he sends them these prophets. And what did they do, for the most part, with the prophets that God sent them? They hated them, ignored them, and killed them. That's what Jesus says. They hated them, ignored them, and killed them. But along comes his prophet. Now, let's look at the clarification of who this is because Mormons say... This is a prophecy of Joseph Smith. 
And Muslims say, this is a prophet, a, a prophecy about Muhammad. Did you know that? A Muslim who knows their Bible will come to this passage of Scripture and say that Muhammad is promised right here that he would come, a prophet like Moses. So let's see what he's going to be like. I will raise him up a prophet from among their brethren. Here's what the Muslim says. He is among their brethren. The Ishmaelites are brothers with the Israelites. <laughs> you think that's what God means here? No, me neither. He's talking about an Israelite. And Matthew and Luke go to great lengths to remind us that on his mother's side, Jesus is an Israelite. Like unto me. You know, it's interesting if you study Jesus' early ministry, um, you know, 40 years in the wilderness, 40 days in the wilderness. You know, Jesus does some things. The very first miracle John points out to us, he turns the water into something red. Moses turned the water into blood. You know, you, you start looking at some of these things and uh, he's, he's mimicking in certain ways the ministry of Moses. So he says, like unto me, and I will put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. You know, the prophecy of Jesus in the, in the Old Testament is that he uh, 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 is, a, uh, is, is ready to speak the word of God the way that God has put these words in his mouth. He says in verse 19, It shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. So God is going to require that every person listen to the words of his prophet. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Right? But the prophet, and now he's going to change here. Real quick, let me take you to the book of John, and let me show you in the book of John how the New Testament recognizes Jesus to be the prophet. Um, John chapter 1 and verse 21 is one of the first places. John 1, 21, he says, uh, uh, they, they're talking to John the Baptist. And he says in verse 20, he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ or the Messiah. And they asked him, what then? Art thou Elias? Are you Elijah? No. He said, I'm not. Art thou that prophet? That's what they're talking about. They're talking about Deuteronomy 18, 15. Are you that prophet? He says, no, I'm not. John 1, 25. <clears throat> And they asked him and said unto him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not Christ, nor Elias, neither that prophet? John 1.45 says, When Philip found Nathanael and said unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. We found him, the prophet. Now turn with me to John 4, verse 25. The woman at the well when she meets Jesus and she's talking to him, she says unto him, the woman saith unto him, John 4, 25, I know that Messiah is cometh, when, uh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. So, so here, it, she doesn't use the word prophet. She says, I know that the Messiah is coming, but she's a Samaritan. And the Samaritans did not recognize any of the Old Testament except for the first five books, which means that she's referencing Moses' prophecies in Genesis through Deuteronomy about the coming prophet. And uh, John 6, verse 14. John chapter 6, verse 14. <clears throat> then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet, that should come into the world. And then if you'll scoot back to John 5, 46, he said, For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. So the people who, who believed Jesus in his day recognized him to be that prophet. He's of their brethren. He's like Moses. And what he says, you're supposed to listen to. Turn real quick. Remember, he says there, I'm going to require it of all people that they, they hearken unto me. Turn real quick to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. And uh, this, is, this is when uh, 
Jesus is transfigured uh, before them. It says in verse 1, And after six days Jesus take his Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. His face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. So, so here's Moses and Elijah show up on the mountain talking to Jesus. And Peter, he's, he's like, he's, he's so excited. He's like, here the hell are. You know, the, the Old Testament is summed up like this. The law written by Moses and the prophets, Elijah being kind of the head of that list. And so he answered and said, Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles. One for thee, one for Moses, one for Elias. Because what? here's what Peter wants to do. He says, Jesus, you're great, but that's Moses and Elijah right there, you know. And so I'm going to put them side by side, right? It's like hanging the Texas flag right beside the American flag, right? Can you do that? You're not supposed to. You're supposed to hang the Texas flag underneath the American flag, right? All the Texans are saying no. But everywhere else in the world, you're supposed to hang the other flag lower than the American flag. But this is Jesus we're talking about here. You're not supposed to. You know, I mean, Peter still hasn't figured this out. He's putting Jesus on par with Moses and Elijah. And it says, And while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud. Remember that voice that spoke from heaven that scared the Israelites to death that they didn't want to hear anymore? Don't talk to us like that no more. Well, on this particular occasion, he does it again, which said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then what's he say? Hear ye him. And that's what Moses says the people are to do with the prophet. They are to hearken to the prophet. I will put my words in his mouth and he will speak in my name and I will require it of those who hear him. But, verse 20, back to Deuteronomy says, But the prophet, which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. A presumptuous prophet is to die. A prophet who comes up with his own ideas Instead of speaking forth the word of God, it's capital punishment for that particular prophet. So what God is doing now, and he's, he's already done this. We've, we've looked at this a little bit earlier, and that is, what if this prophet actually gives a correct prophecy and then tells us we should go follow other gods? Well, you don't listen to him. He's got to be put to death. What if this prophet speaks presumptuously and what he's saying doesn't line up with the word of God? Well, you don't listen to him, you put him to death, okay? And so he says, uh, verse 22, But when a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if that thing follow not nor come to pass, that thing which the Lord hath spoken, uh, that is the thing which the Lord hath spoken, but the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. You know, there's a group of people in the United States uh, and around the world right now that uh, practice predictive prophecy, but they say that New Testament prophecy is different from Old Testament prophecy. They say New Testament prophecy, you have to learn how to do it and work into your gift, and so it's not always accurate. So you just do your best, and then over time, you get better and better and better at it. I'm not, I'm not kidding you. There's a group of people that call themselves the Kansas City prophets that used to practice this and teach this, and, and probably if we started going through a name of, of these kind of folks, you might recognize some of them because they kind of they kind of got some some big name preachers involved with it for a while. I don't know if they still are or not, but some uh, uh, missionary organizations, some youth missionary organizations, really got got involved in all of this. And you know, it's real simple, folks. If you're speaking the word of God, it's going to be accurate and true. If it's not accurate and true, God didn't speak speak that to you. He, he didn't he didn't tell you that. You know, I, I mean, a lot of times it wasn't I, was this year. I, I heard a prophecy <laughs> earlier this year about what all was going to happen this year, you know, and this and that and the other. And, you know, and, and, and it was it was so vague that it would be really hard to, you know, it was it was it was vague things, this, that and the other that were going to take place. And 
you know, I just attributed it to bad pizza the night before and went on. I didn't, I didn't pay any attention at all to it. Uh, most of the time, I don't. Predictive prophecy, I, I've got a good friend who stood up and said, uh, remember when Mike Huckabee was running uh, for president a long time ago? He stood up and prophesied, or he, he said, he didn't prophesy, he said, it has been prophesied that Mike Huckabee is going to be the next president. <coughs> and the church goes wild. My friend calls me. He's like, hey, guess what I just heard at church? And I said, well, I, I mean, what do you do with that? Either he is, and, and we go, okay, it was, that was accurate prophecy, or he's not, and you don't pay any attention at all to that fella, which is which is what you should do. You shouldn't pay any attention at all. You should not be afraid of someone like that. You should not, you should not uh, be interested in someone like that because prophecy is real. So, I mean, just imagine if Jesus had come on the scene going, you know, I'm going to do my best with this prophecy thing. Here's what I think is going to happen. But if it doesn't, oh, well, we'll, do, we'll try again next time. No, that's, that's, not how, that's not how prophecy works. If God puts his words in that prophet's mouth, then what's going to happen? Whatever God says, okay? And so um, the people of the day were led astray by false prophets. We're warned about false prophets in our own day. And what we really need is we really need to listen to that prophet, the Lord Jesus Christ, the prophet. He's the one. He's the one who absolutely every word that he said has and will come to pass we must hearken unto him amen amen let's pray father we love you we praise you we thank you for this evening and god we just thank you for jesus we thank you that we can know him have a relationship with him we thank you lord that you sent him to be the propitiation for our sins we thank you lord that every time he opened his mouth it was truly the word of god that in him is he is the truth, Lord, and we can know truth by your word. And it's so, it's, it's so important, Lord, that we know the word of God. God, sometimes people get caught up in, in seeking through horoscopes and astrology and enchanters and witchcraft and all these things, seeking for occult information. Father, guard our hearts. Uh, guard our little ones, Lord, as they grow up, to be able to, to recognize and remember that you've told us that we're not supposed to mess with that kind of stuff. But instead, what we need to do is we need to hear what Jesus has to say. And he has spoken in the word of God. And so, Father, just put a hunger and thirst for the Bible in our mouths and help us, Lord, to be able to, to hear the word of Jesus. We love you, Father. We praise you. I thank you, Lord, for each and every person tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. I love you. Glad you're here.